<laughs> well, hello, everybody. It's so great to see you guys. Nice, friendly faces. It's, it's, um, don't you just love this magic that we have right now? The magic of, of the internet. Who would yeah. have ever thought? I mean, Arthur C. Clarke probably never would have picked anything as amazing as this. I know that uh, Isaac Asimov started on, had some things that were similar to this, but uh, what we can do is incredible. I mean, and for free, it's even better. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm going to have, um, I guess, if you guys want to do your thing and whatever mute or whatever you're going to have to do, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. I'm, I'm, this will be about 45 minutes and um, I'm going to try to sum it up as best I can. I, this is the first time I've done the talk on Operation Onion Ring. So I have no idea if it's going to be enough information that you guys will understand what happened or if it's too much or what. So I look forward to your feedback later because I'm hoping to do this talk other times and other places. So let's get to it, all right? Okay, so I'm gonna be speaking about Operation Onion Ring and each one of these different events that we've, been, we've done, and we've done several over the last few years are all run um, named about food. And these are something that Mark Edward, who's here, well, he's wandering around right now, but have named. And so if it makes you a little hungry, it's not my fault. So I'm going to define a few terms first. Now, this is a skeptic script, so you probably all know this already, but I'm just going to define a few things for you just so that we're all on the same page. The first thing I want to talk about is that I'm going to use the words interchangeably, psychic, medium, and grief vampire. Psychic is probably the word I'm going to use most often. It means somebody who's claiming to be able to speak to the dead. Well, I mean, it, it could be somebody speaking to dead. It could be somebody else who's just um, talking about, um, you know, predicting the future or telling about your past or something of that sort. So it could be any of those and above. It could mean to a lot of things. Uh, a medium is usually someone who claims that they're communicating with dead people. These are dead people. Think about that. And a grief vampire is a term that Mark Edward came up with to, to a, a nice way of talking about persons who we can't use the word fraud, we can't use the word con, um, any of those kinds of things because we might get ourselves sued or something like that. But we can use the term grief vampire. And it, it really does fit them very well because a grief vampire is someone who is, who is um, going to uh, prey, P-R-E-Y, on person's other people's vulnerabilities, their desperation, their loneliness, their lack of, of whatever's happening in their life that they want some kind of information on. They usually latch onto people and prey on them. And in all the work that we've been doing over the years, we found that almost all of the people who are victims of the grief vampires tend to be sizably women, way over, not sizably women, but oh, mostly women. <laughs> I said that wrong. So a sitter is another phrase you'll see here I'm going to be talking about. It's just a sitter is a person who's sitting for the um, for the psychic or the medium. And they could be over the phone. They could be over email. They could be um, in person. It could be in a large audience. But usually the person who's getting the reading is the person who it referred to as a sitter. Now, these two phrases you've probably heard a lot. Um, they're books written on cold reading, I think. And cold reading is the most common way that people are um, communicate or are doing their thing. Psychics are doing their thing. It's the generalities that people um, are, they're, they're either picking up on things about you by looking at you, listening to your voice, looking at the rings on their fingers and or lack of rings on your fingers, um, you know, smelling you, uh, listening to, looking at your age, all those things, plus just cold reading statements that are just general statements that people are uh, throwing out there that could be something like, a, you know, oh, I know you have, I, I'm getting this, this feeling that you've always wanted to write a book. If you've got a novel inside of you, if you only could just get yourself to write that book, you would, you know, I feel that's really important. Well, that applies to almost everybody. So it doesn't mean we're going to write a book, but we all think something in our lives might possibly be something we could write a book about. So these are cold reading statements. And the people who do these readings, psychics, mediums, grief vampires, same thing, they're really good at what they do. Most of them are. They, they're glib. They've done, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of readings. They're practiced. They're usually really good at gab, you know, filling in the silence and, and, and just 
like uh, doing a lot of word manipulations. And that's what we see a lot of. Now, hot reading is more my field. And this has been going on for a long, long time. But now that we're in the pandemic, especially all on Zoom, it's even easier than it was before because most of us are on social media. If we're not on social media, then you tend to be skipped. And that's just the way it is. And they move on to somebody who's got a more open Facebook page. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do hot reading. I've written about this in um, several Skeptical Inquirer articles, including using Ancestry, newspapers.com, uh, social media, legacy.com. And then there are private um, uh, subscription services you could do that are kind of like private eye ways of finding out information about people. Everybody who tells me, oh, I'm not on social media, there's nothing they can find in me. It's like, yeah, well, if you were born, there's something that could be found. You probably had an announcement in a paper somewhere, and you've probably been mentioned in somebody's obituary somewhere. So unless you have, like, your name is really, really common, it's, it's pretty likely we can find something about you. And there's a lot of ways of doing it. But anyway, hot reading is my specialty. Hot reading is also what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So I have done with my team of gorillas, and um, we've done a lot of <laughs> I've done a lot of uh, different uh, stings. And every time we do one of the stings, we we record everything, we get pictures, everything we can possibly do to have it is information for later. We really want to be able to have other teams of psychic. Uh, busters out there and other skeptic groups that can help out and uh, follow our lead, learn what we did right, what we did wrong, and be able to use that in your own event. So I'm not going to go over into detail of these. They're all on my website. The very end of this talk, I'm going to give, we'll have my website on there and you guys can check out all the articles you want and fall into the deepest, deepest pit of rabbit holes in the world that find, if you find this interesting. So tonight I'm just going to talk about one sting, and this is Operation Onion Ring. And it's with um, this psychic, uh, we call him a grief vampire. His name is Thomas John. And Thomas John fell into my, my world. I didn't know who he was. Um, he was just presenting in a uh, Hollywood uh, or Los Angeles uh, venue. And we had a sting in mind. I had a sting in mind I wanted to do. And somebody said, hey, this guy's in the right place at the right time. Why didn't you try it out on him? And it was called Operation Pizza Roll. And it worked beautifully. We caught him hot reading. And you could read all about it. <laughs> read all about it. But um, Thomas John has done several TV shows. He's had two TV shows that have run on CBS and one on, I think, ABC, CBS All Access. And I think lifetime and they're one term one season shows so seatbelt psychic was the first one i've written a lot about this um it's where people get in the back seat of the car and he talks to dead people as he drives them in circles around um los angeles and it's supposed to look like he's an uber driver or something then he did another show called the thomas john experience and that's kind of seatbelt psychic except sometimes he gets out of the car and he goes and talks to people in their in their homes or wherever and then he also had a Vegas show at Caesars, and that was a live in-person show. And we had a lot of fun sending different skeptics in to go see him and record the events and mingle with people and talk to the people who were obviously his friends at the venue. It was, it was great. We've written quite a bit about this. Pandemic happened, and oddly enough, Thomas Dunn <laughs> did not see it happening. Um, we, have, uh, we have proof that he didn't see it happening, too, which is even better. But if you, the, this article right here, you can find in the New York Times Magazine. This is, I think, from 2018. And this is Operation Pizza Roll and Operation Peach Pit. And um, you can read about that later, too. It goes into more depth. All right. Now we're all caught up. This is the, um, what has happened is we've all, you know, been mostly home ourselves. And the psychics haven't been able to do their venues and go in and do their talks and venues and, and the readings with people. So they've turned to Zoom. And Zoom has actually really worked out well for them. Now, I know these people's faces are all distorted. That's because it's a screenshot and I didn't want to have their names or their faces revealed. But it just gives you a general idea that they're almost all women. And there could be as many as 300 people that attend one of these events. $20 a person, $25 a person times 300 people is a lot of money. And a lot of this is cash. 
or, you know, through PayPal or whatever. Plus they're selling their uh, other things that they do, which are, oh, uh, you could buy private readings from them. You can join spirit circles. You can get candles. You can get prayers for a year. You can get, there's a lot of things you can get. There's, he sells a lot of swag on his, on his website, as do all of the psychics. You know, they're all selling swag. So this is a, uh, uh, just a general event um, with, like I said, it could be up to 300 people. They come and go uh, in and out of Zoom, and it's about $20 a person, something like that. These are um, something that my team and I have been attending for through the pandemic, and we've been writing about them. It's not only Thomas John. There's other people as well. The writing we've done on this is all called Operation Lemon Meringue. It's, it's been really interesting because as they appear on the screen, their name is also on the screen, on the Zoom screen, and he'll call on somebody. Almost always the person he calls on is somebody with an unusual name. And uh, we can find their Facebook profile just minutes after he's called on them. So we're, my team and I are watching these live, looking at the event unfolding we're there hidden away because you can't see us amongst 300 people. You just change your name on the screen like I have. And you put up your decoy like I had earlier with just a, uh, your close your close your video off. And he, he doesn't know you're there. I don't know why he doesn't know you're there. He's supposed to be psychic. So what ended up happening is, okay, this is how they've been making their living right now. What are you going to do? You know, we can we can research it. We can we can go and talk about it. We can get the information into articles. We can talk to the media. We can try our best to get the most information about these people. But there's not anything you can do necessarily to shut them down. There's no law. You can't write to Zoom and get them to stop. So what he did is he decided he was going to cross what I call a, a very big line in the sand, and he was going to start doing readings for children. So he advertised this virtual circle for children back in probably December of 2020. And it was an eight person event. And this is a spirit circle. It's gonna happen over Zoom for ages five to 12. So that to me was really kind of not okay. Um, you know, it's one thing messing with a bunch of adult people um, their, you know, their grief and, and so on. I mean, it's a free world if you want to spend the money. I, I think it, you know, I, it's not for me to tell you what to do or not do, but they, uh, when you were, we're talking about children as young as five years old, it just felt really wrong. So now what do you do? He's going to have the spirit circle in April. It was April, 2021. And he has, um, you know, he was advertising it. In January of 2021, he was announcing that it was almost sold out. You know, he's got eight tickets. How hard is it to sell out eight tickets? So I and my team were just, you know, how do we get this canceled? You know, how, this is just ridiculous. And we couldn't figure out how to get it canceled. We wrote, we wrote to um, the, the, the people who he takes the money from. I can't think of their name all of a sudden. And they just, you know, we said it's exploitive of children. And they said, oh, that's awful. We'll get back to you, you know, kind of thing. There wasn't much we could do. So I reached out to different people within our skeptic community who have like a bigger, bigger megaphone than I do. And I got a hold of um, Stephen Novella, who I'm sure you guys all know. Um, I hope he is a neurologist at Yale. I thought his academic title might have some weight. You know, he's a neurologist and he's at Yale. And in the skeptic community, you all know him as uh, Stephen Novella from the Science-Based Medicine blog, as well as the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. So I thought, all right, Steve said, I'll write it, I'll research it, I'll write something. And he did. He did put out this article. Basically, it says, you know, it's probably not a good idea messing with the brains of children and telling them that, that they're in contact with their dead family members. It's probably not a good idea. It should probably be canceled okay that's basically what it says he says it with a much more academic and doctory kind of voice which is great i thought okay let's see if we can get um uh thomas john to to cancel and you know refund the money to his other people and or just reach out just do the adults the mothers or something well that didn't work well and here's what thomas john's question 
Um, we had a couple people. Why are we doing something for children? Um, you know, this is what I have to deal with the crazies in the world. So, you know, somebody said, why are you doing something for children? You're taking advantage of children. No, we're not taking advantage of children. We are having an event for children. Children are spiritual too. Well, there you go. So children are spiritual too. So, <laughs> Depression. oops, sorry. Depression. Um, we have so, you know, what do you do at that point? I, he, he wouldn't cancel for that reason. He wouldn't cancel for, uh, you know, Thomas, uh, Stephen Novella doing a talk about it. He wouldn't cancel for any other reason. So, you know, I'm kind of stuck. How are we gonna keep this from happening? So what we did is we had a little talk, uh, my team and I, and we did get a hold of a, uh, somebody from NBC who was very interested in doing this. But she wanted to investigate him, but only her editor said that she wanted to investigate him only if um, they could attend. So as I'm trying to explain to her, we don't want this to happen. This is dangerous. It's not a good idea to have this happen, let alone having, how in the hell am I going to get a, a news reporter to attend? There's only eight people in the psychic. That's nine people in this event. How are we going to get a ninth person, a tenth person into the event? I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to go about doing that. Um, so I wrote another article or two, kind of just begging for help from somebody somewhere who'd be able to get some information out about this, you know, and to be able to end, end this. And nothing happened. And in the end, the new, the new um, I said, okay, let's do this. We got to attend, obviously, because we aren't going to know anyway. So here's what happens. Let me go back to the screen and I'll tell you what I end up doing. Screen share. Again, here we go. And a couple people. Come on, Thomas, I don't want to hear you anymore. Okay. So here's what happens is I went onto my Facebook page and uh, I, I love Facebook actually. I mean, I know it's got its issues and its problems, but it's very nice to be able to connect with people. And this is, I had asked on Facebook if there was anybody I knew who had a, somebody who looked like they could be 12, but was actually 18 that would be willing to be on the on this two hour uh, event on a certain day at a certain time. So obviously it's it's time can time, you know, a problem with time if somebody can do this. And on the right hand side, this is Cherie and her daughter Lilith. And they live in New Zealand. They're in the South Island of New Zealand. And I've met Cherie a few times because I have a, a, a I've been to New Zealand to talk to the New Zealand skeptics a few times. A really great um, skeptics group over there. And they have a conference actually coming up this weekend. Make sure you guys show up and on Zoom for the Australian and New Zealand conference this weekend. So they said that they would participate. Now, Lilith is 14, but she could look 12 and she's been doing some acting. So it'd be great for her to be able to to um, do this. And they, they said they could be free at the time to do it and so on. So it was, so it was like, oh my gosh, we've got somebody all right so i'm like okay great now now uh this is four days before the event four days i have to pull this together and now i gotta come up i have the money because we're a nonprofit that has some money in it our grant was from the james randy educational foundation for the james randy and i said okay now this is April of 2021. So there's a pandemic on, I'm not leaving my house hardly at all, but I have to get to the bank. I had to withdraw cash and then take it to my local uh, CVS. And I bought a visa card and cause you can't buy a visa card with just your credit card. You can't do it online or anything like that. So I had to actually go and do this. It was really kind of creepy cause I'm, I'm running around getting this all done. And I had just like maybe an hour to do it because I gave the credit card number to uh, Cherie and she purchased it from New Zealand. So we had to do it over Facebook Messenger. It was very time you know, sensitive. Let's go, 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 go. So uh, one of the things they have to do is they have to, uh, this is our receipt. So I got a receipt for the purchase. I, I, you know, I thought, well, oh, I've got a person, I've got the visa card, I got the money. Um, are we going to get a ticket? So I managed to get a ticket. This is again, four days out before the event. You can see it's $400 for that ticket. And also you'll notice that there's our information on there. So we had to come up with an address, a phone number and contact and so on. And you can see 
the visa number is also on there, 7405, the last four digits of the visa number. That kind of can be important if you're purchasing more than one ticket for an event, because um, the psychic can, gets this exact same information I do. So don't tell me there's no way the psychic could find out who you are if you buy a visa from another, um, you know, a, one of those cash visas. They sure can. So all this information on here is false. Um, we came up with real addresses and real phone numbers, but it's not her real address and phone number. So there's no way he can find out who she is. Um, I, I gave her the name Joe Martin, which is as generic as you can, can be. So I made sure that he didn't, um, wasn't able to uh, Google her or find her on Facebook. There, it just wasn't going to be possible. Um, so what I did is then I sent an email to Thomas John's people. Now, Cherie and her daughter did not see this email. They are given as little information as possible about what is going to be in the email. So what I said is, um, Kia ora, Thomas John, uh, that's sending you greetings from beautiful New Zealand, which I hope you will visit someday so I can see you in person. And it went on to say, you know, maybe a paragraph or two about how uh, her name is Ida. We changed her name to Ida. How Ida is having a lot of problems in school because this pandemic has been very stressful for her. We're in New Zealand and her grandparents live in London and we, um, England, and we haven't been able to visit them for quite some time. Um, grandma died around Christmas time and grandpa's still there. And, you know, we're really kind of nervous about my siblings that are taking care of grandpa because of reasons, whatever it was I gave. And I gave names for the grandparents that I made up and um, her schoolwork has really just been awful because of the stress. So that's kind of more or less what I told them. I told them the name of my child and, and, and so on. And the email is completely sent through people who had looked it over who were from New Zealand. So it would look like it was written by a Kiwi and that was uh, intentional. But again, it wasn't Cherie or her daughter. They didn't have that much information to know what was on the email. This is how we're double blinding it by the people who will be attending the event will not have the information that um, the psychic could come back later and say, oh, I was just reading your mind kind of thing. So the only people who are gonna have this information are the person who received it which would be Thomas John or the person who wrote it, which was me. Um, we did this before with Facebook um, and that's how I've done a lot of my stings by creating an extensive Facebook pages. But in this case, because we're four days out, I don't have time to create Facebook pages for a mother and daughter living in New Zealand. It just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked. We didn't have anything ready to go and we couldn't have gotten it. So I've, what I've done is I funneled it down to just this little bit of information is he's given. That's it. He can't get it from anywhere else, not from her email, not from her name, not from looking her up on Facebook. It's not going to happen. So we've got our visa, we've got our ticket, we've got, we've got an email from him. We're ready to go. Okay, so this is super exciting. I was doing a happy dance. Um, all of this kept going, you know, okay, let's try the next step. Oh, that worked. Okay, let's try the next step. Oh, that worked too. So I, at any moment we were thinking we were gonna have to call this darn thing off. So now, now the next problem, how do, I mean, she can get into the Zoom room, her and her daughter, but how can I get into the Zoom room? How can my team watch what's happening? That's, that's the next step. How do I deal with that? So Thomas Don notoriously usually sends you a video of the event after the effect, you know, after the event. But I can't rely on that because who knows, maybe we don't end up getting a, a, a recording from him or something. Um, also, how are, how are we going to see in real time what's happening? Because remember that my New Zealand team does not have all the information on the email. So they don't know how to answer him if he asks a question. They don't know what to, what is fact on the email and what's not. So what I and my team members did, JD Sword and Mark Edward, we, we created a messenger Facebook chat and we put Cherie in there. And what we're doing is we're having a conversation with her so that whenever, whenever Thomas John is going to be live on the screen saying something about a person in the family, like if he said, and who's uh, Michael? She's, she's not going to know what to say. So when we hear, 
the, the plan is when we hear Thomas John say, who's Michael, one of us would be able to type in the messenger chat, that's your father or, or whatever the answer is. Okay, I hope you guys get this because it is a little complicated, especially if you haven't been following along on all the other things I've done over the years. It's kind of like falling in the middle of a soap opera or something and I'm trying to get you all caught up. It's, it's, um, it's, not, as, it's not as scary as probably Game of Thrones is, but uh, this is real life. <laughs> so, so with that in mind, I've got to come up with a way of getting into the event and seeing what's happening and my team members who are not here in, in at, at my desk, how are they going to be able to watch what's going on too? So here's what I came up with. So you can see here on the screen, this is um, the New Zealand team. And on the screen, she has her name. It says Ida Galaxy J, J6 Plus. So we can write whatever we want on our screens. You see mine says a Cerberic Gerbic, which is what somebody called me a long time ago. And I kind of think it's fitting in a lot of ways. The, the paranormal community has called me that. I, I kind of like it. But you can write whatever you want on your screen. So what the New Zealand team and my team, the, the Gorilla Skeptics, practiced is we made sure that um, her screen said this name on it. And we practiced how this was going to work. But as soon as she signs in to the Zoom call, I immediately signed in because I have the Zoom link using my decoy. And this is, I turned off my, my audio and I changed my name to Pat's iPhone. Okay. So um, now I'm in there too with all the other um, eight participants, the, the eight participants, myself and the psychic. So there's 10 of us in this Zoom room. And my audio and all that's off. And the New Zealand team and I had practiced what to say if Thomas John brings it up and says, um, you know, who is this other thing? We got to throw it out of here, whatever. If he, if he was to realize that it was a problem, because he's psychic, right? Then we had, a, we had it planned what we would do from then on. But um, one of the plans was if he brought it up, she was just going to say, well, I, I don't know. I, this is how I have to get into Zoom. I don't, my, my son or somebody set it up this way. And I just know this, is, you know, my audio is here, my video is there, whatever. And he did bring it up, to be honest with you. He said to the team, and I have this all in video. He says, um, there's 10 people here. It looks like 10 screens, you guys, but there's really only nine because the other one is just like a, I can't remember how he worded it, a throw off or something else. Just ignore it, he said. And, and because my video is turned off, he can't, it, it falls off the screen. So I'm never really shown on the screen whenever this is going on. He's got it turned off so that I just kind of gone. And in the same way that all of you, Linda and Jim and um, anybody else here on the screen, JD, that has the, your audio and your video turned off right now, you're turned off. I can't see what's going on in your homes or anything of the sort, but you can still see me and you can hear me. And if you were psychic, you would think he would know I was sitting there staring at him just like you guys are doing to me right now. There's more. So obviously he did not know. All right. Um, so here's a picture of what my setup looks like. This is, this is, um, you can see that I'm sitting at the monitor I am right now. I have three screens. And what I did is I put a little tripod right in front of me, put my iPhone on it, pointed it at the screen in front of me, put a charging cord on it so I wouldn't have to have that. And then I went to, when I had him on the screen, I went to my phone and I live, screen, live streamed it onto Facebook. And I put it into a private group called Operation Grief Vampire, which is where my team, Girl Skeptics, are located. And that place, we were able to go in and, and, um, and they could watch live what was happening from the comfort of their homes, wherever they were. And the other thing you can see possibly in this picture is I have a large camera off to my side. It was actually off screen, but it's on a tripod just pointed at the screen. Just another way of recording the video just in case something did happen. I mean, it wasn't the greatest quality, but it was something I came up with four days out, remember? This is all happening. So, and then here you can see, this is Mark Edward. He's, he's 
in my in our living room and he's got it up on his laptop and he's just kicking back watching the event show you know happen so he can watch because he's on a live feed uh, that's being broadcast to a private room on Facebook where my team is actually watching and then my team is able to um, communicate I have a couple team members were able to communicate to the New Zealand team so I hope that isn't super confusing all right <laughs> All right, we're ready. Here's the day. Here's here is what our gallery screen looks like. There are these children here, and I've got them blocked out their faces for privacy reasons, and the names are not on the screen. But at the time, you can see the children, you can you can see the parents' names, and my team members over in Operation Grief Vampire are looking up all these parents' names on Facebook. And I think we found all of them, but like two on Facebook, and we could see what was going on in their lives. And we could see and hear, you know, we could, we could look up obituaries, we could do anything. We had two plus hours to, to handle these readings and we're watching them. And there's Thomas John here in the right-hand corner. And in the lower left-hand corner is my New Zealand team, Ida and Pat Martin, or Ida and Joe Martin. I can't even remember right now what we called her. It was, it was so generic. So, um, we're ready to rock and roll, right? Okay, so we're ready to go. So we're sitting here watching this, just like you guys are watching me right now. He couldn't hear me, and I couldn't, uh, but I could hear and see everything that was going on. Now, I'm not going to go into great depths about the about the readings, because they're all on the article that I'll show you at the very end. I sum up every single one of the eight readings in a little blurb. They were about 10 minutes he gave to each of these these children. There was an induction where they had the children all close their eyes and dream about the person that they wanted to contact. And also, um, this is a, a screenshot that I've changed so you can't really tell who they are. The person in the middle and the bottom, that's a little boy and he has very long hair. And Thomas John called him a girl multiple times and uh, until his grandmother, who's who's his guardian, um, you know, said, no, he's a, he's a girl. And uh, above him is a large poster. Now talk about cold reading. There's a large poster with his mother's name on it. And all around it are all these photos of good times the mother had. So if Thomas John hadn't been hot reading this little boy, he sure as heck didn't have to look farther than the screen around him. And that's just another thing that people do is they're able to, to, um, to, to get information from there as well. So as we move on, you can see that the children were actually uh, some, you know, there was a little laughter here and there, but for the most part, the children were kind of distressed. This is a little six-year-old girl whose father had died. And it, it, there was tears. There was, it, it was really hard to watch. Um, anybody who has any empathy for children would see how bad this was for them. Thomas John has said he didn't really do these things before. He was trying to be kind. He was trying to be nice to the children, but you can tell that this was not, it was manipulative. He was trying to talk them into becoming psychics in the future um, and so on. But here's, here's a little 12 year old girl who's crying her little heart out because she's no longer seeing the dead people in her family, which her mother really wants her to do. And she's growing up. These children are all starting to let go of their grief. They're, they're forgetting their family members. They're forgetting, you know, how the grief. The parents haven't necessarily. And they see this as kind of a, a identity for their child to have this, um, this relationship with the child, to be able to uh, see their child as special. There was one little boy, the little boy I was showing you earlier. He had seen, he had said when he was little, the kid's six. When he was little, then people would come to the door, shadow people and stuff like that. And Thomas John said, oh, they won't come to you again if you're always good. You know, if you think good thoughts, you won't have this happen to you anymore. They'll leave you alone. It's like, what are you saying? You know, <laughs> oh, it was awful. I have it. I had to watch this video so many times. We had it transcribed. Rob Palmer um, transcribed the whole thing for me, which was fantastic. And um, so I, I have in depth what's going on on the article that I'll give you at the, at the end. You can see how the children are just kind of like, you know, they've been on Zoom through this pandemic and here they are just bored to tears for two and a half hours listening to these other readings. 
I had to watch as well as my team. It's, it was something else. So um, when it got to the time to do our reading with our New Zealand team, he was spot on. He went right on it, just exactly what was written in the email. Your grandmother this, you know, your grandmother that, you, you know, something about you being in London. And then he had to fill out 10 minutes because everything in the email took him about two minutes to read. I mean, he put it in his own words. But so to get to the, to, to get to the next part, so what he's doing is he says to, um, to the team that, um, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought for a second there, that the New Zealand people, he's going through reading all of it to them. You know, he's using his own words, but um, he's, he's like filling it up with the rest of the information by, by adding like eight minutes of stalling and then somebody who had a garden, somebody who liked flowers and all that other stuff, okay? So that's where we are with the New Zealand team. He hit it right on the button, exactly what was in there because there was no other information he could have gotten. It was all from her. So um, that was the end of that. Now, there was another reading a little bit later. There was another reading that was a little bit right after them and it was another team a, a mother and daughter um, group, and um, they had, oh, here they are on the left-hand corner down here at the bottom, and this is Julie and Jasmine. Jasmine's the 12-year-old, and they were at the event also. Now, we couldn't find any information on Bailey, uh, uh, Julie and Jasmine because they had such generic names, but he was spot on, apparently, about their reading. He was able to give them information about uh, their her brother jasmine's brother who had left the house he was not going to participate in covid protocols he didn't want to get vaccinated and uh it was very stressful she was having problems with school oh and her her schoolmate's father died of covid and so jasmine was very stressed out about um covid and how her family wasn't protected and on and on so thomas john comes in and he makes her feel good. Um, Archangel Gabriel and Michael or whoever is watching over her. She has a, she has a hawk, spirit hawk that's watching over her. And um, he gets in touch with her brother, um, connects to him. He, you know, he sits and thinks about it. He says, yeah, I've, I've got your brother here right now. And he's, he's going to lead his own life, but everything's going to be okay. You're just going to have to trust that it's going to be all right. Let's just move on. Life is going to be good. You know, draw or write or whatever it is he saw her doing I don't remember at the time but it was you know uh, they were like oh yeah yeah that you know makes sense right at the very beginning of their reading though one of the things he told them was you're you're there's a there's a family friend that died of COVID and Jasmine and and Julie are like looking at each other like no I don't know anything about that and he says there they had it was a friend of your friends. It was your father's friend. And they're looking at each other, still don't know what he's talking about. And he, he's like, no, it's your father, your friend of your, one of your friends, one of your schoolmates' friends, uh, um, one of your schoolmates' fathers died of COVID. And they're still kind of looking at each other like, what? You know? And then at the end of their reading, after 10 minutes, um, Jasmine finally says, oh, I know who you're talking about. That's her schoolmate's Jasmine's schoolmate's father. He died of COVID. That's right. And Thomas is, John is looking at her like, yeah, that's what I was talking about at the beginning of the thing, you know? So here's what happens. Julie and Jasmine are my people. We sent them in as a second. They volunteered after Mark Edwards said, why don't you, why don't you get in touch with this, this other person? She looks young. She's young. So this is, <laughs> you can't tell on the screen, but the father, Douglas Harris, is sitting on the other side of the mother on the laptop throughout this whole thing. And that's his McKinsey, McKinsey Harris. And this is Bailey Harris. And this is a, she's a science writer. She's written a bunch of series of children's books. Uh, she has puzzles out. Hey, Christmas is right around the corner. Look for, if you have any children in your family, why don't you pick up one of these jigsaw puzzles on evolution she's got all sorts of uh, books out um, even her little sister's written books and um, this is uh, she's she's was at PsyCon uh, last conference we had in 2019 she was 13 very 
mature. And um, Mark said, why don't you try to get a hold of her and see if she'll do it? So at the time of this event, she's 14 and she, they were willing to play the part of Julie and Jasmine. So it, another thing I wanna to point to you is here in the background, one of my Facebook friends said, when she, she heard we were gonna do this, she says, well, these people are atheists that are attending, aren't they? Why don't you have a, like something in the background that, <laughs> and see what happens? So I, I told uh, Jasmine, could you print out a picture of something religious and put it behind you someplace or put a cross on the wall or something where it's right in the line of sight for, the, for Thomas John? Sure enough, she printed out this beautiful photo, put it in a frame, never referred to it. Just It just sat behind her and it was there. And she had the most religious reading of all of the readings that were happening. He went right into the religion for her. So it was quite interesting that another cold read, he was looking at what was behind her. So here's what we did is I did the exact same thing that I did with the New Zealand skeptics, except I did this two days before the event, two days. So uh, I said that, um, you know, I sent an email, fake email. I made a new email account for Julie and Julie and Jim Jones, I think. And we put that on there and we sent it to them. And um, it said the same kind of things where it was like, oh, you know, we're big fans of you on Seatbelt Psychic. We've been watching it. We've been watching it on uh, um, during the pandemic. And we, we, enjoy so much your show. My daughter's just really shy, which she's not. Um, she's not been doing in school well because her brother has left the household. Oh, by the way, she's really freaked out because of COVID. And one of the one of her school friends' fathers died of COVID um, recently. And we're just been really freaked out about it. And she's very worried. So basically, that's what the email said. Again, the exact same thing is with um, the New Zealand group. There was no way that the... Um, he could have Googled them or found them on Facebook or any of that because all the all the information Thomas John had was in this email. Um, so, you know, that's how it went. So here I'm going to sum up here a little bit. Uh, what do we learn? Well, we learned that um, here I am. This is a screenshot of me when I was getting things tested out to see if it would work and everything. I'm staring at him. I am staring right at him. I'm his biggest detractor. I've written probably 12 articles about him. Um, he, he calls me a crazy cat lady and all sorts of things he's talked about me. He knows exactly who I am. And I'm staring at him during his eight person call, Zoom call, and he doesn't know I'm there. I mean, that's, that's a tell right there. Also, Here's Mark Edward, one of the biggest uh, 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 busters of psychics and, and knowledgeable about psychics is sitting there watching him live also, as you can see on this screen. And, he, and Thomas John doesn't get like a feeling up his back or something, some kind of some kind of juju scary thing. Not only that, the rest of my psychic uh, uh, busting team is watching him live also. There's a whole bunch of people sitting there staring at him that are skeptics. But he doesn't, he doesn't seem to notice that. And then I just want to point out James Randy, James the Amazing Randy, is the person who funded us to start with. And he gave us the money to be able to do this. So this $800 that we gave Thomas John of the $3,200 he raised that day, part of it came from James Randy and his foundation. And there, this is a picture of Mark Edward and myself with James Randi, one of the last times we saw him. And it's, you would think you would notice that. The other thing that we, we um, didn't happen is that he was almost sold out in January. So why were we able to buy two tickets at the very last minute from him? He couldn't even sell out an eight person show without having the, psych, the skeptics buy the last tickets. And then lastly, here's all the people who, these, these people who have real family members who have died. They have real backstories. They have real issues that could have been discovered. If Thomas John was a real medium communicating with the dead, he would have known right away that these people were not there under their real names. Their dead family member should have come around and said, hey, that's my daughter right there. And she should, what's going on? She's never used that name before. What are you talking about? That's not her. He should have known that these people were really 
you know, there's, there are skeptics and they shouldn't have been, you know, with their own dead departed people following them around. I should mention that when I created the backstories for these people, I interviewed Julie and I interviewed um, Cherie to make sure that um, I didn't create characters that would match up with the family that they actually had, you know, the same names or anything like that. I wanted to make sure that couldn't happen. Also, I said, if this man is a real medium and can communicate with the dead, what will he find out about you? What should he be telling you? And so they gave me like their family history, who's actually died and what their names were and so on. He never came across any of those. So that was all really, really telling. So you can read all about it. Read all about it on Skeptical Inquirer, the Operation Onion Ring, Thomas John and the Children. You should have no problem Googling Operation Onion Ring to find this article. It is quite long. It's long on purpose. Um, I want these children to be able to have something to find when they finally grow up and, and are looking into this. They'll be able to see what their reading was and how we were able to look at their Facebook pages and see the same thing he was doing. It's a little moment in time. We've just preserved it for them. I've changed their names and I've changed like their locations and things like that. This is our website. Um, our nonprofit is called About Time. And you can go to abouttimeproject.org and you can find a series of articles I have written on um, on the grief vampires that we've researched, especially a lot of them through the last few years. You can learn about all the other things that we do and we're associated with, including the Wikipedia project that several people here on this call are in. And if you want to take a picture of the screen or if you want to look at it later, but please do check out our website. And that is my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. What was the vampire's reaction? Well, we know that Thomas John, what Thomas John said? Yes. Uh, I haven't heard. I, I don't think he was happy about it, but um, we know he saw it. We know he, he saw it because what we do is when we write up an investigation about Thomas John or any of that, we, we make sure it gets onto the social media, Twitter and Insta, uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook for sure. And we know that he's seen it because it gets deleted and the person who posted it gets banned. So it's one way of making sure he has it. Plus, we also know he has a Google alert on his name and, and he has many Google alerts set up for, for different things. So I'm sure he's seen it. I'm sure he's not happy. <laughs> It, it's also, by the way, the whole report is on his Wikipedia article, and we know he reads that. He tells, uh, his, he tells his fans, do not look at the Wikipedia page. Anybody could write Wikipedia. It's all lies. So, of course, you know they're going to go right to Wikipedia to see what the lies are, right? <laughs> Send more people to Wikipedia, Thomas John. Send them all over there to read your not read your Wikipedia page. You had said that uh, the... Uh, information that you sent to him was double blinded so the people didn't know about that email that you sent to him then were they confused when he was trying to explain the stuff out of the email to them mm -hmm. so Somewhat. they didn't know anything about it <laughs> well yeah it was pretty simple they had the basics and the emails were really simple i mean there wasn't a lot yeah. of information in it they had a, they didn't know any of the names of their loved ones um they had some or locations, things like that. They had basic information, but what was happening is as they were getting a question, um, like the New Zealand team is sitting there, that mother and daughter, and yeah. Thomas John says, so your grandmother has died. They kind of look at each other and then they look down at the, the um, messenger box that's at the bottom of the screen and I or JD or Mark Edward is typed in there, yes. And they say, yes. And so there's always this little pause where they're they're they don't really know what to say. And he said, uh, she died recently. And and Ida said, no. And then I'm typing in, yes. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> he's, she said, well, she just looks confused. I mean, she's playing a 12 year old. Yeah, and so yeah. um, he said, uh, it was recent, wasn't it? And she's like, well. Uh, I guess. And he said, was it around Christmas time? And she said, yeah. And he said, well, that was recent because it's only April. So that was four months ago. 
oh yeah you're right and it's <laughs> yeah it may not be recent to a 12 year old <laughs> but that yeah but he 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 was in other words he had more information than they had yeah <laughs> Don't come any at me. indication that he's uh curtailed his business i mean does he have any shame at all well well definitely no shame but i think we <laughs> saw that he was doing readings were eight dollars so they dropped the price on the readings for a while there. I guess he's having some problems. Um, I, I, I would not be surprised, but I don't know this, if he's having a little bit more trouble getting TV deals and um, because we flooded the internet with information on him. I mean, we've made it as, and of course there's also a Wikipedia page. We flooded it with as much information about him as possible. So it, the Seabelt Psychic, was out whenever we, I even learned of who he was. And then the other two shows, well, the, the, the show that came afterwards was kind of in the works um, whenever we started publishing. And then um, the Vegas show, I don't know, you know, that was kind of a little bit afterwards, but from, he couldn't sell out his show. His show was, um, I think like within the first month of his show, he was he was having to sell the tickets on a like a, a discount um, just to fill put butts in the seats kind of thing. I had a uh, there's a skeptic group in Vegas um, that that are all friends of ours, and what we did is we we sent them in one at a time, and they went into the show with a with a you know with a character that they were playing, and uh, they recorded everything, and we could also see on Ticketmaster, you could see the seating chart. And you could see how they weren't filling. You could see that, you know, that mm -hmm. people were scattered around in this room. It fit, I think, 106 people, but he was having getting 50 people in it. So I think that was, that's another reason he's probably not going to be able to do Vegas again. They say it's very expensive because you have to pay for, you know, your lodging and all sorts of stuff. You have to hire people and it, it's, it's expensive. And so I, I don't know. But I think that we've been whittling away at his his income. He's got a lot of nasty Yelp reviews. Um, I, would, I would think that uh, you know ex exposing him as exploiting children would put him in bad odor. Yeah, I, th that was the only good thing that came out of this, Linda, is that hopefully there's some. Hopefully the kids when they grow up will will see this, and hopefully. I mean, they may be watching this video right now in the future. We don't know, but say hi to the kids, you guys. Hi, kids of the <laughs> hi, future. <kids. laughs> we really, I'm, sorry, I'm so sorry you had to go through this and to find us out this way. But <laughs> I hope you're enjoying your hoverboard and flying cars. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have flying cars? Yeah, I really would like to know. Ch definitely look me up if you're one of the kids from from this time. Please mm. look me up, or my one of my one of my children, or whatever my whatever please, please check us out. But yeah, so that's good. And, and just the fact that I think it kind of did, people were like, wait, he was with children, you know, that they did children that just. But to be clear, it's hardly the only dirty laundry this man has. Yeah, but it seems like with children, I mean, what's the next? He's going to start, you know, reading the dead of, pup well, I guess. Miscarriages. No, yeah, we had a one psychic who was it? Uh, Chip Coffee, Chip I Coffee. think he was doing readings of people who had miscarriages or or whatever, you know, of the dead. It was, but that was not really like super known. This is I have all the audio, I have everything, so I'm just waiting for media to kind of take this seriously, and and do and 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 report back on it because the media is really kind of the person's who the the agency that's make perpetuating it not any, only the tv shows that they're allowing to do they don't take it seriously they think it's funny they think it's they think it's cool um the morning tv shows not just with thomas john all of them they do these infomercials for them it's um john oliver did a uh, the comedian john oliver did a um, investigation and how easy it is to get your product on these on these um, local news stations. Um, you could pay fifteen hundred dollars and they'll do like you know a segment, a ten minute segment that's just an infomercial, 
And the people who are in these local news stations, they're trusted by the people, the locals. These are people you get up in the morning and you have your coffee with them and you get to work and then you listen to them when you get home from work. They're, they're trusted individuals. And if they're giving credence to this, then, um, you know, with no critics. So the media is really Dr. kind of- Dr. Scary. Oz, a cardiac surgeon. Oh, I know. You know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot of it. The problem is, is the media. And I, I love the media. I love, I love the media, but in this case, it's really been uh, the bane. And so they take it seriously. I, I think this is going to be constantly going on. If not this, it'll be something else. Right, Linda? <laughs> Attachment therapy and who knows what. It's, it's just, until we can get the, me the information out where the public will be able to go, oh, Maybe you need your own TLC show where it's like to catch a psychic. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> or somebody. Actually, yes. we've, we haven't tried that. Yeah, we've been approached a bunch of times by people who want to do something with us. We've got all kinds of different. We um, just went through like six weeks of. Yeah, we, we've had them all the time. They all want to do something. But what they want to do is they want to tell the story of somebody who's already been caught, somebody who's already had jail time or whatever because they're afraid of the, the legal ramifications and or they want to only feature people who have had extraordinary things like they've lost their whole business and hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars and stuff like that. We can't get them to, when I talk to them, they say, oh yeah, I get you, Susan, I get it. But, with, but I say, look, to that person who had $75 taken and, and they're crying, they're just devastated that they have just been manipulated in this way. And that $75 might not seem like a lot to you or I, but if they're trying to keep their, their heat on in their house and it's, you know, between the psychic and the heat bill, this is a big deal. But the, but the, the, the people who approach us say, oh yeah, yeah, I get it. But can you give me the name of somebody who's really been like on the brink of, of devastation? That's the person we want to hear from. They don't think they can sell it to a network. That's the thing is the network say, mm -hmm. uh, we need something bigger and more elaborate, not, not just how people are being vulnerable and, and being taken advantage of. And plus, you got to find people who are willing to go on camera and say, you know, I, I, I did this and I feel really bad about it. You need a perfect victim and, and the perfect villain. Yeah, it's interesting what you're saying about social media too, because there's so many like network shows that even started on YouTube or whatever. Like Dr. Pimple Popper was on YouTube before she was ever on TLC. And she's just sitting there popping zits. Oh, <laughs> thank you for going there. Um, uh, yeah. It's just, you know, people keep telling me podcasts and YouTube and stuff. I've got a huge YouTube channel with videos. Nobody's watching them. Really? <laughs> No, it's not all on psychics. Some of it, a little bit is, but you know, it's just time consuming and stuff. It's, there's so much competition out there. Yeah. There's some people who've really yeah. made their way in the world with starting with a podcast, but that's one person out of, you know, maybe a thousand who can't get 10 listeners a week. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a cutthroat business out there business. It's a, it's a big deal. It's really hard. It's, it, yeah. you have to get lucky, just the right person, maybe watching today here on this event will go, you know, I know Rupert Murdoch really well or something. <laughs> like, hey, I don't know. It's going to take somebody like You've got to do your makeup while you're telling the story. Oh yeah. That's it. I should be. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do let me crimp my hair while I'm doing the event. That's how Watch you sell it. I'm, I'm waiting to see Susan on Dancing with the Stars. Oh, that would be funny. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, no. That, I, <laughs> and yeah. Oh my gosh. I would get up and try, but I would, no, 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 Rob, that would be hilarious. I, I can't believe you put that together in such, in just a few days. Yeah, that's amazing. It really is remarkable. Thank you. I, I, you know what the thing is, is if I had known I was going to do that in advance, you know, and had a little time to plan, I, I probably would have overthought it. But when you're in the, in the moment, you're like, okay, I need to find somebody who'll go. Do I have anybody who'll go? And somebody says, I'll go. And you're like, okay, I got somebody who'll go. Now I got to get a ticket. They're going to be sold out. Oh, wait, I just got a ticket. Okay. They said they'll go. We got a ticket. You know, it's just, 
then, like I said, it was just the next step. How can I do this? Well, and then, as I said, the news anchor was going to, NBC said they wanted to do the story if they could go. And I said, well, how could I allow them to attend? How could they sit and watch it? And, you know, it just comes to you. And these things are not that they're complicated or anything of that sort. It's just like MacGyver. <laughs> Using the technology that we all have, that we've learned to use over this pandemic. It's, it's um, <laughs> been interesting. <laughs> I know some of the previous operations that you've run, Susan, your, your, um, your process has been a little bit more sophisticated, more than just like, let's cram some hot read fodder into an email. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about what it is you'd normally do for folks. We would normally, I have a team of people that run Facebook pages. They're still out there, the Facebook pages. They're not connected to our own Facebook pages. And they're just, um, they're, they're mostly dormant right now. But we want to be able to have the psychic be able to look at a Facebook page and say, um, the, the person would say, hey, I'm going to be attending your event. I'm so excited. I really want to hear from my sister who died recently. And, you know, maybe we could put up a fake obituary or something. I don't know. And it tells a story. And then the, the Facebook pages talk to each other and they say, how was work today? You know, oh, my gosh, you know, my boss is driving me crazy and put up memes of cats and stuff like that. So we have these Facebook pages not connected to us at all just an anticipation for us to be able to do other stings. I, um, I, participated, I participated in one of those as the person who was creating a, uh, the uh, Facebook posts for the character that Kenny Biddle played. On Operation um, Peach Day. Actually, can I share my screen? I'll show you one of the posts that I put up. So this, is, uh, this was Kenny Biddle was playing Ed Caffrey when he went to Matt Fraser's reading. And this was one of the many posts I had in Ed Caffrey's Facebook account. Mm -hmm. So it's it's elaborate. Um, the the sting we did with Operation Peach Pit we put together in ten days. The one with no Operation Pizza Roll, Operation Peach Pit, the one that Rob's showing right now was months. Operation Bumblebee with Chip Coffee was six months, I think, of, of Facebook pages. But once you have Facebook pages, like I said, I really like Facebook because I've learned to use it well. You can just clean things off. You can take an account, change the names, hide posts, put a new character in there. And then you have a Facebook page that has a long history, which is what they're looking for. They don't want, if, if you approached a psychic with a brand new page, it's only been around for a couple of days. That's, that's a red flag. So if they see a page that's been around for years, they're not going to scroll that far back. If you put the good stuff, the bacon bits right at the very top, they're going to say, all right, we got this one. She's got a sister who just recently died. Cross it off. What's her name? Okay, good. Let's go to the next person. And that's how, and that's all they need to know. That's how we do it. Mm -hmm. So what kind of parents, uh, like what are the parents like that take their kids to a psychic? Like what uh, was like their reasoning or their, their way of, operating yeah Romero that's a good question nobody's asked me that before so these were all women as I said one was a grandmother who had assumed um, the guardianship of her grandson they all were multiple attendees so when you heard them talk they they would say you know normally this happens or one woman said normally my my cousin my younger cousin who died comes through so that must be him so like when the psychic said thomas john said i'm getting a younger man the mother seized on it and said that must be my cousin because he usually comes through whenever i get readings so it was often that these people attend um very likely these people the women have been doing it for years and maybe their family has also been you know involved in psychics these aren't people who um necessarily just had a loss in their life and immediately have um, gone to psychics i think this is something they've had the belief for a long time they want the children to follow in their footsteps it, that was clear um, it was also clear that the the children didn't necessarily want to be there one little boy was trying to explain how to use zoom to his mom at the beginning that was hilarious he's he tried to mute when we were just waiting to get into the event you know waiting to for thomas john to be ready and he hit mute and the mother's like don't mute it i want to know what's going on i want to be able to hear and he's like no mom we have to <laughs> we have 
the mutes and they don't hear us. She could hear him arguing with his mother. He was obviously far more events than she was in a lot of things. And then we had another one, um, one of the little girls who was crying, I showed you a picture of her crying. She was five or she was six. Her mother was a medium. We found her immediately. She has, she, she has a, a website where she gives readings, but her older son, I think he might've been eight or nine. He was the one who was originally signed up to attend. And he said, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I am having nothing to do with it. And she's, and Thomas John said, he's just not ready yet. And um, she, so she roped in her six-year-old daughter. You're all like in shaking way, your heads. That's how I feel too, you know. In a way, they're also uh, preying on the parents that uh, believe this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, the, it was clear the mothers were the ones that wanted to go. They're the ones that wanted the reading. They just asked one little boy, I think he was nine. The mother said, he wants to hear about his grandparents that he never met, right, honey? And he's like, yeah, can you tell me about my grandparents I've never known? They died before I was born. And Thomas John told him, it's like, kid didn't care. <laughs> it was what the mother wanted to hear. And another one, this is funny too, because Mark Edward used to work on the 900 lines. I don't know if anybody remembers that. And he said that when you're paying $3.99 a minute and somebody calls in, they are going to be right on you. You know, you get in, you got your call, here's the psychic, you're talking to him, and the person says, and the psychic tries to tell you some, oh, so here I am to talk to you about, do you want your lucky lottery numbers? Do you want to know this? Do you want to know that? And they're like, I want to hear about this. Tell me about my love life, quick. You know, and they get right to the point because they're paying $3.99 a minute. And so this woman, one woman, um, Thomas John started to tell her, you know, it's standard reading is I'm getting an older person, an older male figure who could be a father figure, or it's an older female figure, you know, it just fits anybody. And uh, he started in on that with this one mother. And she said, she says, stop, I want to hear about, he wants to hear about his father. Oh, she wants to hear about her father who died a few years ago. It was like, you know, I'm paying 400 bucks. I've been on this call for an hour. You finally got to me and everybody's only getting 10 minutes. So let's get to the gist of it. Let's see. Tell me about the, tell me about my husband who died. You know, it was really quick. Wow. So it's four, $400 for a 10 minute reading. Well, if you look at it that way, it took two and a half hours. Yeah. But it was 10 minutes about was all these people got. It was a lot of stalling. The, um, uh, with our New Zealand team, he spent about three minutes talking about uh, it's your grandmother, right? Because she's telling me she's your grandmother. Now, this is your maternal grandmother. That means it's your mom's mother. Is that right? Your mother's mother, right? And that's the one that is your grandmother, because that's what I'm getting is she's your maternal. I mean, he went on for maybe three minutes, kind of in that same vein of, of trying to figure out what he was going to say, and he was stalling. Or maybe somebody was looking it up. Maybe he hadn't read the email. I think he's just, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't read the email until right before and somebody's feeding him the information and, and saying, it's a grandmother in London. This is her name. This is a, a girl's upset because her so-on and so-and-so. But the funny thing was, is that Thomas John was saying, you know, you guys got to do good in school and stuff. And the mothers are telling me, these kids are great. They're, they're A students whatever the equivalent to an A student is in New Zealand. She's doing fabulous. She's just, you know, top of the class honors and everything. And he's trying to say, oh, your grandmother's telling me you're not doing well. And one had um, the New Zealand grandmother was baking, was telling her memories of how something to do with cupcakes they baked together, I think. One of the other kids was a kite. Now, I'm, I'm not kidding. He said, Something about a kite, either you guys were uh, a memory that the father had of them flying a kite together or watching somebody flying a kite, or maybe you're flying a kite now and that's what he's talking about, or maybe it's a drawing of a kite. I mean, it was just that bad. It was horrible. Did the, <clears throat> did the women seem satisfied at the end with the... Yeah. They did, huh? Yeah. I don't know if they felt like they got $400 worth. I don't know how big of an impact $400 was on these parents. 
Yeah, but, that's, so that's one of those cognitive biases, right? Where when you when you sink a lot of money into something, I for, forgot the name of it, but if you sink a lot of money into something, gambler's fallacy. Oh no, not the gambler's fallacy. Sunk cost, right? Sunk cost. Thank you, thank you. You should Jeff. know this, Rob. I should. Sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. So if you sink a lot of money or time and effort into something, you're very reluctant to admit you made a mistake. In fact, you'll sink more money in it to confirm Justify to yourself it. that it's true. Yeah. Absolutely. So they were unlikely to have done it. These are the kind, but. Now, I've been writing about Thomas John and others for a while. I am getting emails and messages from, from people who have started to suspect them. Something happened, and they'll write to me, and they'll say, I Googled him. I found his Wikipedia page. I was looking to see how old he was, or I was wondering if he has children. I was um, just some, uh, either they were curious about him for something that had nothing to do with being skeptical of him, or they were looking, saying something didn't feel right. And then they like Googled uh, his name and then the word like scam or skeptic or something like that. And they'll write to me and they will tell me. Um, and it's pretty sad. Some of the things that, that these people have done or, or uh, uh, how manipulated the, the, the sitter feels. And um, some one woman wrote to me, she said, I gave him, I think it was $1,400 to get a reading as an emergency because you can, you can pay more and get your reading quicker. And she says that um, then I Googled him and I realized what was going on. And she says, now I feel really stupid, but I think that what he's going to tell me, um, what did she say? She says, now he's going to, he's going to Google me and he's going to find the information really easily. And I Googled her. Sure enough, she'd done a newspaper. Uh, she'd done a couple interviews in her town of New Jersey. I think her son had shot his girlfriend in a parking lot and then shot himself. So it was murder suicide. He had a lot of um, mental um, issues that the the girlfriend had been trying to hide from from everybody, and he just. He had a gun and he, he killed her and himself. And so she went and did an interview and the, the, the girlfriend's mother also. So they've been in the news a lot in their local town and the reports were easy to find. So she says, I know exactly what he's going to tell me now. <laughs> so she was upset. She's trying to figure out how to get her money back. I kind of helped, I hope. But she was going to, she bought tickets to go see uh, Teresa Caputo. So that's the other thing. I can show you how this is being done. I can expose the psychic you're talking about, but it's that not my psychic, right? That psychic, yes, but not my psychic. Teresa Caputo, oh, come on now. She's the real deal. She's, She's on TV. Crazy. She's real. But I can tell you how bad this is just from an experience a week ago. Yeah, it was last Monday. Uh, there was a person on a Zoom session which was recovering from religions discussion. And it was at the end of the day, there were maybe 15 people online. And someone, I had done a what's the harm in believing in psychics presentation, which someone brought up. And then a woman, a young girl, probably young 20s, said, wait a minute, before you guys disparage psychics and mediums, I am a psychic medium. Okay, now that was a little awkward because I was, I was co-hosting at the point and I didn't want to put down a client, right? But um, I said, well, okay, maybe you believe they have, you have these powers. I do have these powers, but okay. But the danger is in falling for believing in someone who absolutely doesn't, and even people who we've proven. Give me an example of that. So I told her this exact story with Thomas John. I told her about the New York Times article. I told her about the fake Facebook accounts. That it, well, maybe he was just having a bad day, and then you know he really is psychic, and he's a medium, but he knew he wasn't going to perform well that day. That was her explanation. We only hope that maybe she thought about that later. And, I hope so. But but if she I'm believes surprised. she's psychic medium, you know, there's no chance in that really. It's very sad. There's I the, uh, there's only two, three things I think we can do. The first, and um, anybody who who's an activist like Linda here is, um, the things are, first off, you have to inoculate the population so that when they get into this situation, that they're going to need some sort of medical therapy or a psychic or whatever that they say, oh, I remember hearing about this before and those are tricks of the trade and this other kind of stuff. So you have to give them enough uh, background so that when it does come up and it might, they will say, mm, 
not this. That's there. Wait, let me go back and look that up. What was that person's name again? Let me look at the Wikipedia page or something. So you have to inoculate them. We need to teach our children to think critically. And that's really kind of hard because we don't have a lot of kids that we could have control over. And the schools certainly aren't doing it. And we have no controls in schools, obviously. And the third thing we got to do is we got to make these media companies understand that there's serious harm going on whenever they're when they're perpetuating cupping or uh, facilitated communication or anti-vax or, you know, all this stuff that they have a role in that and they can stop just because they think they're entertaining. They need to say, you know, in the past we've, we've done this kind of stuff, but maybe we should probably be a little more responsible and not, and not air that kind of thing. More some puppies and are, kittens. Some things are worth more than eyeballs and clicks. We need to find a way of making eyeballs and clicks for the stuff that's real. And, and I don't know how, all, all I know is I can do these things and um, hopefully they're entertaining enough. Somebody's going to have to do my story and put it together. JD Storm did, um, I sword who's here right now. He's just blacked out. He did a talk for um, Operation Onion Ring, but I just gave. He did it in 15 minutes for um, Skeptic Hal. It's uh, not out on video yet. But it was, he summed it all up in 15 minutes. So he did a really good job being able to do it. And I'm struggling with 45 minutes. So I got to cut back even further. But um, I think there are people out there who have more skill than I do on how to tell the story quickly and um, could edit it down. Um, Thomas Westbrook from Holy Cooley did a video for Rob, if you want to put that in the in the show notes. Yeah, I'll look for that one. Holy Cool Aid, he did one on Operation Onion um, Pizza Roll, and it's hilarious. It's, I think, like 12 minutes or seven minutes or something like that, and it's got a few hundred thousand views already, 300,000 views, 400,000 views, but he was able to sum it up in, you know, with clicky, you know, cuts and, and angles and, and, and funny memes and stuff like that. He was able to do that so that anybody could could watch it quickly and he's really good um, at that stuff yeah so there are people who are very good at this stuff like like jessica was saying earlier that you know i should probably have a tv show oh my gosh it like i said we've been approached on it but i don't think i have the skill to to be on the camera and be the the person talking necessarily they, they need somebody who's actually this is their thing you know and Super edited low effort you could get on tiktok yeah, I, I did a few TikTok things, but again, it's you're one of what hundred thousand people. I've got and we do have a TikTok account. It's called Gorilla Skeptics. I've got four really? videos up there. Mm -hmm. Ooh. We've done TikTok. I I might look old, but I got I got some youth in me. Yeah, you know. I love TikTok. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was great. I think it's fun. But I've got four videos. I have one video I have up there is a psychic who was attending at a restaurant. He's, he and his partner are sitting at the window at a restaurant and a car crashes through the window and comes right into their table. Nobody's hurt, but it was like, you know, the, the traditional psyche didn't see it coming, you know? So I have, I have 30 seconds of, of this clip of the guy sitting there at the table, his partner, and all of a sudden crash through the window with this car. And then they're get up and they're like, Oh my gosh. And then I said, you know, he didn't see it coming. And so, I mean, I've got like 500 views on it or something like that, but it, you just, it's so time consuming to create those little things. I'm not good at creating these things quickly, but yeah, yeah. And then getting eyeballs. Just do your makeup and tell a story. That's all you got to do. <laughs> I think there's a dance you're supposed to do too. Oh, a dance? I can do oh, that. yeah. You have to do the like clapping thing while you have text on the screen. And look at my wardrobe change. <laughs> exactly. And you notice that Jeff and I both have Skeptoid shirts on. Oh, nice. Isn't that funny? <laughs> that is really funny. I think that, you know, the shirt that you have on Jeff is the one that Mark Edward has. It's up in blue and it's his favorite. And people are always like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Science is greater than pseudoscience. But right. people ask them that. Well, back in the day when we saw people in person, you remember those days, you guys? Yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw Brian in person out here. Yeah, so that was that was true. Yeah, it was good. It's good to have him here. I, I can't wait till we can go and actually virtually go places. I know. It's, I mean, we're doing it here in California. I'm in California. I'm in Salinas, California, right by the 
by the ocean. So I'm about as far from you guys as I can be and still be in the same land mass. But um, we're, we're, we're doing really well over here. My, my local group, Monterey County Skeptics, is meeting in person. I think we've had four meetings. We, we just go to like a pizza place and hang out and, and, and complain. <laughs> yeah, we've done a few outdoor in-persons, but the weather's a little cold here now for that. Oh, it's beautiful here. Oh my gosh. 70 degrees or more here every day. It it's was 70 fun. for a couple hours today. It's been gorgeous. I need to go out and plant plants. I have flowers. I got to plant. We, we have a season that grows all year round here. Mm. Any other yeah. questions anybody has? Not about my weather. <laughs> <laughs> more stings, you think? You know, I don't think so. You know, Jeff, I don't think I'm going to do anything else, at least unless something presents itself. I don't know what else I could possibly do. Um, this guy, Thomas John, we've caught him so many times. It's not even funny. I mean, it really is bad. It's it's bad form that he's still getting attention, still attracting people. Um, and I, I, you know, I had, a, oh, I can tell you this other story I was telling, um, but I'm trying to write a book. Uh, it's going to be called Grief Vampire with an exclamation point made up of all the stings and stuff I've done but I haven't gotten to it it's it's all I've been fussing on it a little bit that's going to take a year probably for me to finally get sit down and finish other projects like the weather's been really good and I need to plant and still got tomatoes and um, at least got another month of tomatoes here and but here okay here's something that happened last week um, I had a New York Times magazine reporter reach out to me and she said, do you know of anybody who, uh, of any psychics who are communicating with, with biblical figures? I'm like, what? And I look this woman up. She's a style writer. She writes for fashion. So there you go, Jessica. There's my fashion. So she's a style writer for the New York Times in the magazine. So this is a big, big um, venue. And she's, and I said, so we scheduled a call and she called me on the phone and I wrote back to her. I said, of course, you know, there's lots of them that can use religion and they contact the, you know, uh, biblical, whatever. And she had a lot of questions for me. And one of them was that, um, why would they talk to biblical figures? And I said, well, you can't check. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, it gives you a, a feeling that you have a lot of prestige. You know, if you're talking to, uh, mother mary or whatever that's gonna make you look really good right so she so, said, so the psychics learned ancient hebrew so that they could speak to these people <laughs> doesn't work like that you know it robert oh. doesn't work like that you know houdini was able to um, um sir arthur conan doyle's wife was able to communicate with houdini's mother even though she spoke hungarian my goodness it just translates into <laughs> english in her mind ethereal babel fish in their ears <laughs> and she never ever called him Harry. She called him Eric or some form of Eric. So how? Yes. So I mean, it was just like ridiculous. But anyway, so here's so I'm, I'm exchanging. I, I, okay, so this New York Times writer she writes to me, and we do this conversation. I'm thinking, okay, I'm all ready for for what she's going to tell me. She's, I'm sure she's done a whole bunch of research in it, right? Turns out now this article. I don't know if it's going to come out or not. We'll see. I think it is now. She says that it fell into her lap because I asked her, why would a fashion writer be writing about psychics? She says, it just kind of fell into her lap. Apparently there's these two psychics. I've never heard of them before. One of them doesn't even have a website and celebrities are swearing that these are the best psychics in the world. They're telling them things that there's no way they could have known. Never heard that before. And mm -hmm. she says that these psychics are talking to these celebrities for four hours, four hour readings, four hour readings. So you could re you could read a recyclopedia to somebody and you could find something that would fit in, in that four hours. I said, of course, they're finding lots of stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's not hard. So the New York Times writer is like, how could how are they doing this? Are they hiring private detectives or whatever? Because the psychics are supposed to be using some kind of email thing so that the psychic and the and the celebrity aren't actually uh, they don't know who it is. I'm like, well, I'm sure we can get around that. So the reporter is has a russian name and she got a reading from the psychic and the psychic said who is nikolai 
She says, that's my grandfather. And so she tells me, Susan, how did they know it was my grandfather? How did she get that hit? The only thing I could think of is that it's a common name, but how did she know? And I'm like, she goes, did they hire a private investigator to figure it out? And I'm like, how common is Nikolai to somebody in the Russian world? She goes, oh, it's like Heather or Susan, you know? <laughs> We're like, well, maybe it, she just threw out Nikolai and it hit. Now, I don't know if that's the first name the person threw out and you hit, or it was like the 10th name and you don't remember the first nine names. Besides, she didn't say, your grandfather's name is Nikolai and he's here with me. She said, who's Nikolai? And you said, it's my grandfather. It's like, so this, if you're talking it, to somebody who's a, of Italian background, you're like, who's Tony? Who's, yeah. who's Antony and Anthony and Anthony, Anton, Anton or any of that? Yeah, Maria. I mean, it's just so, so she said, I said, did, I said, is there any transcripts or any recordings or anything from all this? She goes, no. I'm like, well, you don't know what happened. They're just telling you it was accurate. They weren't, you don't know. I said, did, was there anything helpful? Like, did any of the psychics predict COVID? She says, well, one of them says they did. I haven't researched it. I'm like, okay, we'll see about that. And then she had two instances where people had said that the psychic knew something that even the person, the sitter didn't know. One was that there had a, their ancestors had a jazz club and another one was exchanging an email with somebody. And in the email, it said something about a street that his grandmother had lived on. And that was super accurate. He asked his mom and she told him it was true. So I said, okay, well, have you seen this email? She said, no. And I said, how do you know it says it the way he reported it to you? And how do you know there's not like paragraphs full of other stuff? And he only cherry picked the one thing that was in there. And how vague was it about a street? She goes, oh, I guess I should look at that email. I'm like, yeah, I think you should look at that email. And then she says. That's why she's a style reporter. <laughs> <"Wait out." laughs> and, then they, and then she said that, um, the jazz club thing. She goes, well, how did they get that right? Even the person who had the reading didn't know about the jazz club. I said, well, how do we know it was a jazz club? She could have said. It's a four oh. hour reading. How do we know? She didn't say your family has a lot to do with music. I mean, it's been in your family for yeah. years and they owned a, uh, somebody owned a business and, you know, during the jazz era and it turned into my family owned a jazz club. We don't know. So then, so then she ends the call. And every time I tell her something, I said, these are not pri hiring private investigators. This is called cold, cold reading. I said, it's, it's cold reading 101. It's, it's, you can't get any more clear. And she'd go, oh, and I'd say how it was done. And she'd go, oh, oh, well, I'm glad I talked to you because I kind of needed somebody to, to, to center me and get me back on the right track. Okay. And then she sent me an email. We had an email exchange a couple of days ago. She said that, um, Susan, I just want to know for sure, have you ever found anybody who really would, who, I mean, have you ever found anybody who could be psychic? <laughs> <laughs> no. And I told her. It would have been on your front page. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, for real. And she's, oh, it would have been New York Times front page. Exactly. Yeah, Nobel Prize. A Nobel Prize. And Nobel Disney. Prize for the science, Pulse Prize for the write-up. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, seriously. So I, I told her, I said, look, you know what I'm going to say. Of course not. This is just. And she goes, okay, good. That's what I thought you would say. And so she, I guess that's the quote she's going to use for me in the paper, but I don't know. She, it just felt like she got into this thing and she didn't know what she was doing. And then all she did was talking to the believers. And then after she's done extensive research and listened to these people talking forever and did her own reading or two with these people, then she finally says, oh, I guess I should talk to the, psych, the skeptic. And she was smarter than David C. Smalley. Yeah. Want to talk about that one? You can say. Go ahead. So I was going. I don't know if you know who he's a. He's a podcaster. He used to have a podcast called Dogma Debates, and I don't know the reason, but it changed his own name. And I was going to be on to represent recovering from religion. And in the interim, he said you should listen to some of my uh, episodes. So I happened to see one with a psychic. So I listened to it, and he was being cold read, and he he opened the podcast something like. 
this is, I mean, I, you know, I don't necessarily want to say this is real, but she either has a nephew who works for the NSA or I don't know what to say. And that's how he began it. So there was that leading into it. And it was just, oh, my God, how did you do that? How did you give her this? And, and at the end, she got to promote her business and all this kind of stuff. It's like, how did you let this happen? So I wrote him that. And then I actually copied what Susan said about it. And he basically said, fuck off. You guys are never going to come on this show. <laughs> he didn't like being told because he thought he knew, he thought he was. Yeah. He said his argument was, I know what people like to hear on my podcast. Yeah. yeah. When you have a podcast that runs for 10 years, you know, then you tell me what to do. Right. Right. So, you know, that's how it was. So. All right. Uh, anybody got any other additional questions we want to add on? Nothing? All right. Well, thank you, Susan, for being so generous with your time. This has been a real blast for all of us, uh, at least speaking for myself, it has been. And uh, I hope we can have you back down the road. Oh, yeah. Well, we do lots of other things. You guys, thank you so much for having me here. It was a lot of fun. And it was nice to be able to do this talk for a friendly crowd so that I can see where I got to cut things out because I got to get it down a lot shorter than this. I hope it was understandable before mm -hmm. I got to the Q&A. Did you guys kind of get it? Or did you yeah. need me to get to the Q&A to answer further questions? Was there enough information on my talk is what I'm trying to say? I think there was enough information. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> somebody who didn't know what was going on and who hadn't read the article, hopefully they would have gotten yeah. it. I'm, I've got to trim it even further, but boy, it's, it's a lot. So yeah. I signed up for the Australia conference. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, you guys, let's go to Australia and New Zealand. I'm going to be on a panel <laughs> on Saturday. And it's technically Friday here, like 4 PM Friday to midnight and then Saturday 4 PM to midnight. Right. So you guys, you know, this is the chance we have that everything's virtual. You know, might as well sign up. If you don't get to attend in person and, and participate, then you can watch the videos later. But this is a rare chance we have to be able to see what's going on all over the world and be able to do talks. Like I'm talking to you guys in North Carolina. Isn't that great? Yeah. Awesome. So let's take advantage of it. So. And you yeah. might bump into the magical, skeptical fairy godmother angel from the internet while you're there. I think she's going to be busy. I think she's supposed to be doing her thing. I think, this wasn't that what it was? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, she's supposed <laughs> to be busy doing her thing that week. But one never knows. She can just Yeah, she could pop in. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. This has been really enjoyable. Thank you very, very much. Very good. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you Thanks, so everybody, much. for coming out. Have a thank great you. night, and happy Thanksgiving. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes. So, yes. Thank you some of you next year. Uh, next week at Culture Club, but uh, if I don't, I totally understand. Good night. Good night. Good night.